Welcome to this Open Club, European Writers Open Club. Uh, European Writers Club is an EU initiative uh, supported also by the Estonian Film Institute. So we are very happy to be here in Estonia, in Tallinn, uh, for this, our second camp of European uh, Writers Club, Boosting Ideas. So what we do in the European Writers Club is we uh, have built up this uh, scheme, this initiative to uh, to uh, encourage and inspire for co-creation, collaboration, uh, and co-production on TV series for fictional TV series for a larger European audience. And we say at once, which is something we just say, but we actually mean it also, because for us it's important that we try to unite our forces in Europe to tell important stories and also to tell, to uplift the voices of our European writers. Uh, so we are actually right now in Tallinn doing our second camp of Boosting Ideas. Uh, and when we do these camps physically, uh, we have four hubs in Europe we are doing these camps in. It's uh, apart from Tallinn, it's Copenhagen. We just did one one month ago. And then we're doing one <coughs> in Cork in Ireland. And later on in the June, we're going to do one in Spain, Galicia. And we're doing that with Screen Ireland, in connection with Screen Ireland, with uh, ACADIC, the Cultural Institute of uh, Galicia in Spain, with the Danish Film Institute, with the uh, Danish Film School, and with, 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 with Vision Denmark, as well as, as I've mentioned, uh, with uh, the Estonian <coughs> Film Institute. When we do these camps, <coughs> we always do what we call open clubs. And open clubs is uh, a conversation, uh, a masterclass with interesting people, but always from the demand of the local industry uh, uh, and also always with a focus on the process of writing. Because in European Writers Club, as it is said, it's a writers club, it's all about the process of writing TV series and the writers themselves. So that is our core. And uh, today I'm so proud to have with me here on stage for this open club a conversation between a very experienced, very <coughs> interesting producer, sorry, <coughs> Femke Watling from uh, created the company, part owner of the company, uh, Submarine, which is actually based in both London, New York, Amsterdam. Not, no, New, not York. New York, sorry, but London, Amsterdam, Los and, and Los Angeles. Shit, that's what yeah. um, <laughs> and, um, and then you, Tony, Grisoni. And, uh, extremely experienced writer with prominent people like uh, Terry Gilliams, Michael Won uh, Winterbottom, you have what worked else? with them. <laughs> uh, but I think they have been very fortunate working with you. So my new agent. Yeah. <laughs> and he only speaks when he lies. So, <laughs> but the thing is, I would like to just to, to introduce you to these two uh, prominent people. <coughs> uh, I think we should just run some clips to let you know who they are. Uh, so, can we run uh, clip number one on you, uh, Femke? And then we could just talk a little about what you're doing because you are you are really all over in many technologies and many formats. But let's see it. <laughs> This is Houston, do you read? I'm so bored of living. I wake up every morning in the same bed, I get dressed, and I eat the same breakfast and then take the same commute to work. It 
It's a hybrid between live film and animation. This is Ethan Hunt of the IMF. If this is your name on the screen. I need your help. working in so many formats, a lot of animation, but you yourself, you have been actually been doing documentaries as a director, isn't that Yes, a long yeah. time ago. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of how I started out. Yeah? Yeah. And then how did you create this uh, monster of a company working all over? Well, for me, it doesn't feel like all that different, but no. <coughs> like Bruno, my business partner, and I both worked at a broadcast in the Netherlands called VPRO, and yeah. he had there the first and he had set up the first digital department of a European broadcasting organization, like in the 90s. And I worked there as a film documentary maker. Okay. <coughs> and I also had, a, at the same time, worked as a curator for the Rotterdam Film Festival. And I had my own section, which was called Exploding Cinema, which all dealt with kind of the future of film and yeah. technology, TV. Um, and that's how you also came into working with all these hybrids <coughs> that you're really yes. exploring. Yes. So from the start, like we at the at the broadcast at the time it was very much you're either in the internet department or you were in film or tv mm -hmm. and and we were very much in yeah excited by by how digital technology and the internet was changing film and television and for us it didn't feel so different from making a short film for the internet to making television and so we started submarine in order to make an international company and a company where like it's about storytelling first and, and you then figure formats out after. Yeah. Okay. Like so it sometimes yeah. So f yeah, we would sometimes find a subject and figure out, oh, is this a documentary or should we yeah. tell it in drama after, you know? Yeah. And uh, you certainly succeed. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like yeah, it's been a fun journey. Yeah. Tony, we are just turning to you. You you when I asked you, could you show me a showreel? <coughs> 
like the one we just saw? Not like that. No. no. <laughs> I, I, I wish I could. But you are not a company. No, oh you are no, a no. one-man I mean, company. I yes, you are a one one-man band. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you actually told me that there was something that was done when you uh, they, you were awarded to a, for a BAFTA, and then they did something fun. And it was a student. It was a student from um, I can't remember where she came from. She's one of the film schools. Yeah. And uh, she d she decided to make a show reel for okay. me. Okay. And so and she, this is a f this is a few years ago now. Yeah, yeah. So, but I just thought it was really nice, and I haven't got anything else. So yeah. I thought, well, we'll show this. I, I think it it's was fun. I think she it did. Really let's do it. it. <laughs> we run it. It's yeah. uh, clip number two. Have we met before, sir? No. No, I think so. Good. You do your digging and I'll do mine. Now fuck off. Get in. Today, we're all going on a great trip. Let's straight to us. The bloody lot of us. You having a good time? See this? This is the North! We do what we want. Numb tongue. The mind recoils in horror, unable to communicate with the spinal column. Which is interesting because you can actually watch yourself behaving in this terrible way. But you can't control it. If I had conjoined twins, I would cut them down the middle like a slice of bread. <laughs> Just to sum it up, you have worked with, uh, as I said, you have been working with uh, Michael Winterbottom yeah. in this world you created yeah. with him. There's a special journey. We'll get back to that. Yeah. You worked with Terry Gilliams twice. M uh, more than twice. Okay. So many times it's, <coughs> I can't remember. Okay. And then you uh, also worked with Sorrentino uh, yeah. and you did uh, Red Riding uh, where James Marsh was in on. Yeah, he was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you've been really through, and you've been here for a long, long decade. But you actually started out as many things do in, in the industry. You've been all over, kind of. Yeah, I started out as a runner. And oh no! Then, yeah, I did. It was a great job being yeah. a runner. You have no responsibility. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's wonderful. And uh, and then I rose uh, to become your first on a Ken Loach film because the, f the shoot was so terrible that. Uh, people were going home, they were dropping like flies. <laughs> so I climbed up and became a first assistant <laughs> on one film. Yeah, so I did all, and then I was gonna be a producer, and then I discovered it's too much like hard work. And eventually- And, and, and then what did you do to, to become a writer? What, I mean, what did it take you? Did you study writing or did you just simply no. start? No, I'd, I just started. I didn't, I'd, I'd been around, as I said, working, you know, uh, on, the on the production side of film. Yeah. And, um, and then I'd been a producer, I'd made some music videos, I'd made some uh, documentaries, um, commercials, stuff like that, as a producer and before that as a production manager. So I did all of that. And then I just, to be honest, I, dis I discovered I'd, uh, I'd forgotten the fun. Yeah. And I was earning good money, but it wasn't any fun. And I thought, when was the last time it was fun? It was when I was at college. And so I, I, um, I stopped working. You stopped working? Yeah. And, uh, and, and just start doing nothing? 
uh, not doing nothing. I started sitting down and trying to f trying to write uh, outlines of things of films I wanted to see. Yeah. And I did that for about a year and a half, uh, two years, and then started sending them out. And but because but I'd done but all but the other work, did you work, study I, scripts? I did you study scripts to get there? Because I think <coughs> people are often asking, "How do I become a good screenwriter?" Yeah. And and my qu my, my my advice to them is always read and see as much as you can. Yeah. Read a lot of scripts. I used to break explore down. Explore them. I used to break down s films I liked. I used to I used to take a film, watch a film, and then pause it and yeah. write the screenplay for it. Yeah. So, so um, today we're going to talk a little about the relationship between producer yeah. and uh, writer on yeah. TV series, mm -hmm. traders. Because I think it's, uh, it's very it's, uh, sacred, in my opinion, and I'm a former producer, <laughs> maybe still, uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it is a sacred relationship. Uh, and and uh, I think it was, uh, it was uh, I think it was actually Tony Curtis in a really C film with Burt Reynolds about a writer and a producer, and he was the writer, Tony Curtis, and he said, this is my friend, the producer, he only lies when he talks. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, uh, that has kept on to us producers. But I think it's very important to talk about the relationship now, and so, mm. so, so I think it's, that's what we should do. But before I do that, I want to just find out the components of a good story. I mean, because I know I've, I've been trying to reach you so many times and get you on a project, and all the times it's nearly all the times you said, "Give me, a, give me some days," and if I haven't called you back, I'm not interested. <laughs> this is not true. <laughs> the, the, but, but tell me when you when you cut exactly when you get in touch. What are you what are you what are you offering? What are you saying? I'm coming with an idea, a theme, something that I'm interested in, something that I think can become something. Okay, so you might because that's how I work. Uh, as I, as a producer, well, I'm getting back to you because I would like to hear how you work. Mm. But I, as a producer, work that there's something that fascinates me, and I think there's something in this that could be interesting. Yeah, you, but you of course always have to dig into it, uh, and I have to hook you on it as a writer. But so you might say, oh, here's a novel, or you might say, here's a newspaper article, or yeah. you might say, um, I don't know, something like that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it's very difficult for me to know why I won't go for something. I couldn't, I couldn't go through a list of things and say, oh, there's not enough conflict or whatever. It, it's, just, it's just whether what you're suggesting connects with stuff I've been thinking about. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, <coughs> with um, Red Riding, which was a quartet of books, when uh, Andrew Eaton, the producer, came to me and said, uh, do you want to read this and see if you're interested in adapting it? It, it, was, it, uh, it was close to some stuff I'd been thinking about, which was set in the 70s um, and didn't have anywhere to go. Sometimes it's a character. You know, there's, there was a character that I was playing around with, which was a, um, a young woman who had a baby and left the baby <laughs> and disappeared and then returned sometime later and was convinced that some grown man was her child grown up. Mm. And so I, that's all I had. I didn't have anything else. And then someone came to me and said, are you interested in a making a, a TV version of this film? And I said, oh, yeah, if I can make that character, if I can make the central character a young woman, then yes, and then I could bring that story in. So I could, I could. So that's what's happening. If what you suggest connects with something I've been thinking about okay. and concerned about somehow mm. and obsessing about, then I, I get a chance to develop and, and let it breathe that way. If what you're suggesting, it may be an interesting idea to you, and it may be an interesting idea to me, but not it, if it doesn't connect properly. If there are no sparks, I'm not about to, you know give up years of my life mm. doing doing that thing. So that's the clearest I can be. Does that make uh, more sense? Yeah. What, what, what are the components for you? What 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 takes <coughs> you brings you to an idea? What brings you what inspires you to to uh, because when we're doing stuff we are we're spending <laughs> a lot of time. Yes. On a project. Mm. Each project. Yeah and especially T V series can take years. Yeah. And 
Yeah, so it is, a, I think, a combination of what you're saying of kind of like s does some an idea touch me? If mm. somebody comes to us with uh, to me with an idea, um, or of but very often we I also we initiate ideas and go to writers yeah. um, as well. So it's a combination of I think yeah. So indeed, it can be many different forms, but I think like often the things I'm interested in are about how the world is changing. So I'm less interest interested overall in period perhaps than in uh, co more, more in contemporary mm -hmm. stories, more in things how our world is changing, maybe, uh, but it can be a book, an article, it, the writers, ver ver like if everybody comes to me, it's super important to me who that writer is, if I feel connection with, if I mm -hmm. feel like, okay, can we work together for three years, four years perhaps, five years sometimes, you know? So and you make a plan ahead. Yes, I mean, I <coughs> I would say, like, in the past, I would sometimes, like, I still can sometimes really jump in an idea, but I've also realized, like, it is such a, such a long commitment and a marriage, especially television, that you need to really have that long-term plan, like, like, is this subject so amazing that I'll be fascinated? Is it rich enough to, to tell that it brings a whole world that can bring a whole world to life mm -hmm. is it a subject that i can that i think we can find an audience for um and so so how yeah. much is, is the audience in your mindset when you decide on an idea mm. <coughs> maybe it's not the majority it's the, like i think i need to be personally uh, need to love it in order to be able to to really spend the time and commitment and energy and I need oh. to love the writer and and be fascinated by working with this writer or director mm. and when they come to with an idea to us but I do need to see a way where we can realize it mm -hmm. and it can be difficult it can be different but I have to kind of in my head like figure out a plan like okay how are we gonna bring this to life yeah uh, and how is that for you uh, when I mentioned the audience is that you think that's not what I think of first but wh wh where, 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 where's the audience in your mindset and you have to be brutally honest of course um, I, th I used to <coughs> I used to say I used to get really irritated by that question yeah. well, that's why I ask I, I guessed um, because um, and so I used to answer, um, I'm, I'm not interested in the audience, which is a stupid response. But um, it, was because the, uh, it was because of several things. One is, you know, I, I don't think of the audience as being one thing. And we all know that's the case. But I'm also <coughs> realised, especially in terms of TV audiences now, there's a, such a push to get such a huge percentage of population watch, watching one thing. So I understand why all the discussion about the audience. But my fear is that I will s talk down or I will patronise. Um, and uh, the truth honestly is, I've got to sit down and if I'm working on my own or if I'm working with someone else, we are talking about something that excites both of us. And when it really works well, you you kind of you kind of flip and flop in and out of being a maker a writer and being a receiver you go back and forth all the time you you write the gag you laugh at the gag you rewrite the gag you laugh a bit more because it works a little bit better you're constantly doing that mm -hmm. and you then kind of hope you're not a totally different animal from all the other animals out there you know who who are going to be watching so that's the best way I can describe it. And it doesn't I don't find it very helpful to think, okay, this is for uh, you know, a certain age group or anything like that. I, I, I really don't. I mean maybe that's different if it's for for children, but I, I've never written anything for kids. But but we have been talking about I mean, with the difference between T V series and feature films. Uh, which is interesting is that in, at least in the European countries, the Nordic countries, we mm. have this uh, old auteur tradition, which is really unfolded in within. Um, I thought you weren't going to use any obscenities. No, <laughs> but within feature films, 
uh, whereas TV series is much more of a consumer market, which is, I mean, we tell it's a, it's something that this is, it's this a is the floor is yours, Thomas. You're saying this. No, this is not. But yeah. then let me hear what you say. Do you think because I, 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 certainly you can say TV series it's a it's a big big market. It's so much in demand today. You talking uh, about what do I say is the difference between writing for TV and writing for film? Yeah, from my experience. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's a there's first of all yes the auteur theory, which is not any more about it being a theory. I don't think it's about it's it's a an, it's a kind of economic model. Mm -hmm. It's about building around one essential element which is seen as what is usually referred to as the writer director the uh, perverted commas are around writer because it's a rare beast someone who can write and direct mm -hmm. um, and there is always a writer from my experience almost always a writer there but because of that imbalance it means that as a writer it's very difficult for me to uh, initiate a project which is a feature film uh, I've got plenty of times when someone, people will come to me and say, oh, we need a writer to work on this. <laughs> uh, on a feature I, film? Yeah, but then I'm not a secretary, you know what I mean? I'm not yeah. a or a doctor, you know? I c I'm, I'm not there to fix it. I'm there, I want to work with. If I'm going to work with a, a director, that, that's a, that maybe is a different thing. Um, with TV, you know, there's a reason why so many writers are suddenly there writing TV because you have more responsibility, you have more power in the dynamic, um, you know, you, you are not treated as someone who can be f um, switched out at the drop of a hat. So of course you're going to do that. But for me, the actual, although the formats are very different between limited series, returning series, mm. and feature film, of course, <laughs> but the job I'm doing is, for me, is the same. There's no difference in the job. Uh, but, 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 okay. How do you see that? <coughs> Are you because you also you have done a lot of uh, <coughs> uh, single one uh, feature films. You did uh, Apollo with uh, Linklater, uh, and now you're turning, as I can see it, more and more into TV series. Yeah, but I think <coughs> like the o the auteur theory feels like a little old, right? Because there are so few film auteurs left because the market in feature film has mm -hmm. changed so much. So. How many Richard Linklaters are there still really working and making lots of films? There, with Richard Linklater, Paul Thomas Anderson, and then more still in Europe. But there, the impact of those films has has reduced so much, right? Mm -hmm. It's become such a small niche market in a way. And at the same time, in television, you have also equally, I think, auteur, um some writers slash showrunners who see the who you who you could see as auteurs and some. Maybe like a Johan Rank who did Chernobyl for me is equally an auteur as maybe Richard Linklater who did um, Apollo. Apollo, right? Mm. So I don't think it's so black and white that one is the auteur medium and the other is more consumer driven. There's just much more TV because it's such a <coughs> mass market. But in that huge TV market, there are many different areas of of, uh, of filmmaking. Yes, but certainly the, 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 the you can say the the power has swifted with the TV series, where writers yeah. have suddenly become much more... No. I, 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 that, that, that I don't think so. No. Okay, but I can tell you what, if I go to Denmark and speak to the directors' union, that's what they talk about right now. That why are the writers so much in the kings and queens right now of the industry, and not themselves? And so things are... To s that's how they perceive it. But might be uh, different in... But let me hear what you say, because I think... Uh, well, let's let's cut to the chase. You know, I mean, the the thing is, the thing is that my best experiences of working on film or TV has been built around that triangle, triangle. of yeah. producer, writer, director, where you've got your own I area of responsibility, where you you have a, a good understanding of how those those different uh, skills mm -hmm. uh, overlap, uh, and when one comes to the fore more than another. Mm -hmm. um, when to speak up, when to contribute, when to uh, respond, and so on. Uh, th and when that's worked, it's been, it's a, you know, it, c it can be a beautiful experience. Exactly. That's the best. The, the worst are where one of those uh, elements um, has been elevated to a ridiculous degree, and, and it's when it's it's pretty much always not about artistic integrity. It's just about 
um, arrogance and uh, conceit, really. So that that's the thing. When it's when it's built on that triangle, then uh, it, it's it's a great thing. And 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 uh, I sometimes think that <laughs> the the I know it's very unpopular, I'm sure, but I sometimes think the created by credit is just like writers taking on their version of un film de, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's, yes. I, I, it's kind of like, a, all right, well, well we're going to claim this, this area. But, I mean, it's also, you know, I mean, going right back to when I was a runner, the person who gave me my first job was a producer called Tony Garnett, who was the best producer I ever worked with. Uh, with? Four, probably, as a runner, you know? And, uh, and, and he was great, and he, 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 I learned so much from him. And he was a very tough, very tough uh, man. And uh, but he was a very fair person as well. And um, he used to talk about, uh, you know, at that time uh, the dramas were coming out of BBC television drama yeah. department, and it was very much a writer working with um, a producer as a kind of sounding board and so on. And then the director would tend to be found a little bit later once they once the, the, a script existed and then tony would talk about testing the script so you didn't come in and say oh here's the script yeah how much does it weigh yeah i've got some great ideas about how to reinvent the wheel it would say okay here's the script let's test it and testing it meant reading it it meant uh having uh, actors and seeing how it sounded and seeing so what do we think now can we can we improve on this? What, what's working? What isn't working? So it was a very controlled thing, and the producer was in charge of that. Of that. So yeah. very careful, very controlled. I mean, I don't know if that makes sense to you, Tamika. No, totally. I think in that triangle, there's just many different versions of it, right? But sometimes you have a... Like, because in America, there's this myth of the showrunner. Hey, who writes the that. writing, supervises the set, and is in edit. But there, <laughs> I would say, even in America, there are not that many showrunners who really, um, how do you say that, have the experience. experience. Yeah. And the it's like a really different set of uh, expertise and experience. And so I think, for example, in Undone, the series we did for Amazon, there was a writing room with a th and there were two showrunners, and then there was a director great thing about television is a collab like if in a did this was a really positive experience and it was a collaborative process mm. so there were like producers were in the edit there was a director in the edit it became just a different kind of process but i think in europe it's often this idea of like the showrunner who controls the whole thing and in and reality certainly. it's yep. yeah it is this collaboration between a director and a writer and a producer who and so, like for example, I'm working currently with a writer, uh, Mark Williams, who created Ozark. Yeah. But he's also a producer. Like he's a very accomplished producer, and that's kind of new. So he's kind of the showrunner, or what? Yes, he's he's really like yeah. a showrunner. And because that really are the skills of a showrunner. It must be to produce the show, exactly. write it, produce it. Yes. That's yes. I think must be the. Yes. Really skills of. Yeah, sure one, huh? but it's more like indeed more like a producing mindset yeah. than just like the creative part. Yeah, yeah. You s you mentioned um, waiting, testing a script, mm. and and uh, we shouldn't be speaking about uh, so much about uh, how it, uh, the, the the industry is looking today because we. But there's still so much demand. I mean, there's so so much content being produced in such a fast speed. Mm. Just just. How do you see that uh, the testing element is that happening enough today? Do you do you follow me? I mean, because there's so much going on. There's so it's such a speedy uh, industry with a so fast uh, short period from do turning into a green lighting to actually airing it. What I mean by testing it is I mean trusting the writing. Yeah. To start there, that's all I mean. Yeah. And um, but testing, do you also mean to to also be able to change it on its way and uh, work with it, develop uh, it further? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one of one of um, I've had really good experiences working on TV and film. Um, there was a TV show called South Cliff, which uh, Sean Durkin directed. He directed all the parts, and it was a, a 
limited um, series. And um, we, we, we managed to find a, a really perfect way of working for me, for me and I think for him, um, where we had the scripts um, uh, and then after reading them, he would then ask questions. And we were talking about John Emil, who is a, yes. a, we both have someone we both have in common. And John directed the first film I got made, and it was his first film. And because he came from a script editor background, he would ask questions. And it's great because, well, for one, the writer ends up doing a lot of work because you have this, uh, it, you're, you're responding to the questions. You're testing the walls of the house. You know, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing that rather than being given, you know, 20 pages of fucking notes and um, uh, and then go away and want to slit your wrists or actually slit the other person's <laughs> wrists who, who gave you the note. But it's but so to when someone asks questions, you, you, you know, you, you start to respond to it. You start to work on it in that way. And um, and with myself and Sean and Southcliffe do that, um, then uh, what would happen once we got to shooting? Um, I would watch all the dailies. I wouldn't be on set all the time, but I would watch all of the of the rushes. And then we would have a meeting once a week in person, and we'd go through what had worked, what hadn't worked, what had been dropped, you know, all of that. Yeah. And I could then say, okay, with the material we've got left, I will rework it so that we cover that. I will write new scenes to to deal with that. You discovered this thing. Why don't we try and build on that? And we we did that all the way through the shoot. Of course, what we had in store got less and less, but we kept on doing that. And then we did this very similar thing in the edit as well. So the screenplay was a, a living thing, and was was changing in response to the reality. Because that's a big difference, isn't it? When you're writing, you know, a lot of writers here. When you're writing, you're kind of, you know, you you're very far from reality, quite rightly. Mm. You know, and um, uh, a writer Ian Sinclair said it was a, it was writing was close <coughs> to a state of trance. Right, when you're on the set, you're dealing with reality. You know, things are pointing the wrong direction. It's raining. He falls off his horse. You know, whatever. It's it's like it's all and it's people, and and so on. Writing is the is the other is the is right back here. Very very different in the beginning and needs to be protected in that way. So. As I said, that's an example of, of working on a show where which I enjoyed most. But but, but are you on the set working? Are you on the set I often? No, I used to be at the yeah. beginning. I did because I was so jealous, and <laughs> I was I was jealous, you know, because it's like you're you, you know they're going off on a boat and you're left on the quay <laughs> waving. The you always want to do something else. I always no, I, I always want to be where everyone else is, <laughs> as you know, and uh, um, no, so I was jealous and and I wanted to be there and I was. I didn't want them stealing my children and you know, all the <laughs> all the dumb things like that, and, and so I used to I used to be a, a real pain in the ass. And, uh, and why did you quit being on set? Because I discovered that I didn't need to be, and I could yeah. perhaps start trusting people a bit. Yeah. To be yeah. quite honest. Or um, did you get bored by waiting? And I got bored <laughs> to tears. And I, was, I sat there, and it's like I thought there's a there's a limit to how many times I can stand that to the cinematographer and say, yeah, it's great. You know, because what else are you going to say? You know, and and also that's not the time to yeah. say. What are you going to say? <laughs> say oh, you know, I think maybe if you adjust this, it would be good. That's not when you're going to do any of that anyway. No. So. I thought, no, I'm going to eat bad food, stand in the rain, get cold, <laughs> you know, and nod and be enthusiastic all fucking day. <laughs> and it's like, no, I don't need to do this. I can stay at home and watch the rushes yes. as long yeah. as they send the rushes at the end of each day. Yeah. And then, and I think you do need to have one-to-one -one, uh, meetings. And I think once a week is great for that or when there's a problem. And then you can go to the set and no one knows who you are. I think you're an extra, you know. But the trust right. is, is kind of very important, as you say. Ha what? Having trust in your director actually being able to do it and you are... Uh, well, it's not just the director like everyone else. Oh. It's not just you, oh. I discovered. <laughs> in the TV things you direct, uh, you wrote, were you often very closely involved in choosing the director? Yeah. 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 I mean, now, right? now, yes. Yeah. Not initially, no, of course not. But yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I would... I I am, but having said that, I've worked with the, you know, direct uh, producers. You probably know this are very sneaky people. 
<laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah, but no, they, they, it's, a, it's like, again, referring to Southcliffe. Yeah. Um, the producer on that had been talking to Sean very early, mm -hmm. and I had said, I, please, let's not talk about directors, right? I need to write this thing. I need to find out what this thing is. Yeah, of course, Tony, of course, yeah. he said. But meanwhile, I know that he was meeting Sean in some sort of film festival and saying, oh, yeah, you know, this writer, Tony Grisoni, is writing this thing. And he would said, oh, really? I'd be really interested in having a look at that when it's ready. So <laughs> that was going on, right, which yeah. I didn't know at the time. But then I got to know Sean later and he told me. Yeah. You know, and the same thing happened with Red Writing, in fact. Yeah. James, you mentioned James, James, James Marsh. Marsh yeah. James Marsh. Uh, James Marsh, not only have they had that conversation, but James Marsh also then found my phone number and got in touch and then and pleaded with me that I would sneak him uh, an early draft to have a look. Yeah. But then I find all that exciting because it's what it is, it's people yeah. saying, you know what, I take there's something really delicious here. Of course. Yeah. You know, yeah. I really want some of this. Yeah. And so that that adds to the excitement and the urgency of yeah. the of the can, uh, just going into your experience, I don't. We shouldn't be talking a lot about that. Mm. But I mean, you are you have been always also very famous for being uh, on Sorrentino's um, Young Pope, which was a different experience. Uh, not that we need to go into it, but that was how does he? How does how do you come into the picture of a man like Sorrentino? Uh, from you, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I I, I mean, <laughs> I wish I knew. No, what. <laughs> It, you said it, it was Sorrentino's young pope. Yeah. It's very nice to mention a, 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 a famous name in a thing like this. And, you know, but but I didn't work on that in the same way that I would. I worked on Southcliffe, for example. Oh. You know, I, I went and there was myself, there were two other writers. Paolo wrote. Um, uh, I, I was overseeing the outlines of all the these episodes and uh, at the beginning. And then everyone wrote two episodes each, and um, and then oh no, before we wrote two episodes each, then we had a big meeting, and Paolo said, "Yeah, well, so everyone's going to write two episodes each." And yeah, yeah. He said, "But but forget the outlines." I said, "Well, forget the outlines. <laughs> we spent like months doing." Yeah, yeah. Forget the outlines. Okay. So what are, what are these what are these scripts going to be based on? And he said, "Well, just you know." <laughs> oh, okay. So we had that. So I was. <laughs> And then I went and I was really angry. And then I sat down and I thought, oh, okay, fine. So I just started writing stuff. Yeah. And then I had a really good time because <laughs> the truth was, and I hate to admit this, but the truth was I had, there was no responsibility. And so I thought, well, okay, you know, and I just danced around and had fun and put this. So all of these scripts went in. Then Paolo, who, I don't know how he does it. He must have extra time in another dimension or something. <laughs> or, and, and also has enormous energy enormous energy he then takes all the scripts and he cherry picks takes what he wants <laughs> reassembles this one <laughs> it, 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 and suddenly there are all these episodes right and then and then he shoots them uh and then you you go and you have oh, a big uh, screening in venice and you go and watch them so, oh yeah i vaguely remember i had something <laughs> to that scene but it was round the other way somehow and then and then people say oh yeah tony you worked uh on Paolo Sorrentino's yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah. It, yes, it was fantastic. Uh, no, it was great, but it was fun in the end. But it was yeah. a weird one. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, you know, I, I've I've had that fun. I wouldn't go and have that. So fun you had again. a piece there and a piece there, and so. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was. I mean, it's just he 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 just took all the bits he liked from different scripts and just kind of put them together. So he did more than just put them together. I mean, he's, he actually has a very a very good sense of structure. It was quite extraordinary. But that's how he. Used yeah. his writers, so it wasn't a writer's room. It certainly wasn't. It was him. Writing. It was yeah. him. You know, but it you was him with yeah. all these these people coming up with ideas, and then him yeah. him using them. It's great. <laughs> uh, we have asked the two of you to um, to come up with a scene that has uh, given you some learnings or inspired you in some way. Um, also, because I mean. When you have been doing this for many years, you have scenes where you say, "What well, this is the scene that actually where we've provided, cr we've created something great, or which mm. I really learned that uh, don't ever go there again, or whatever." And and so uh, you are currently you did a documentary called Bellingcat, yeah, about the Bellingcat. So you may, might set the scene because it's a documentary. Yeah, it's called Bellingcat: The Truth in a Post-Truth World. Yeah. And it was a film we shot in 
like between 2017 and 2019 about the Bellingcat group, which is a group of young people. They call themselves citizen investigators. They investigate cases that fascinate them. Yeah. Um, and they've become quite influential. Yeah. A and uh, and we should get back to what his what you later yeah, on has yeah. made out of that. But let's just sh uh, show clip number three. Doesn't speak a word of Arabic, and he conducts his profound research from the comfort of his armchair in his home. I'd like to I'd like to talk about uh, a very new way of investigating. The way citizen journalism investigations are trusted is different than professional journalism. Don't believe me? Here's the evidence. So there we see the bigger impacts here. And there's one, one further. Oh, this is James Rackford. They've made sure they've got wind blowing in. Like a time machine, we can go back to the day of the MH17 shoot down on Google Earth. The fake media tried to stop us, but I'm president and they're not. Right now, they're winning. So we need people fighting against that. So, <coughs> just tell us how did you came about this, and also what has it then given to you? Because yeah, I yeah. know that there's a big story in this. Yeah. So, we were shooting Bellingcat <coughs> for like we were filming them for about two years, I think. The film came out in 2019, and already while we were shooting, I mean, I was like, I think Bellingcat is an incredible group, and while yeah. we were filming, I realized this is just. Um, yeah, there's just it's so incredibly new what they're doing and um, in terms of the way they work in terms of what they are right they're kind of a mix of maybe journalists a mix of spy but then without any support of any institution they're not part of a newspaper or secret service or government they're just individuals yes and they're regular people and they're kind of normal people and they're fighting for truth basically and in a very different way than hackers or wikipedia because they're very much about being transparent about their sources yeah. and and so on, and there was this <coughs> one scene when 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 we were f when when I saw the footage of that scene where they th in the film we follow kind of the MA17 the airplane that got shot in the Ukraine, and there was this one scene <coughs> where they were explaining how they proved it was a certain missile launcher that had shot the airplane, and how they had come to to find the evidence for that, yeah. and um, and it's. I think I thought it was this clip. If we we have this clip. You want us to show it? Yeah, because maybe it's, it's quite nice. Can <coughs> we try clip number five? This video was taken on the day of the MH17 shootdown, five hours before the shootdown, and you can see the mo one of the most important details is on this book. We can see one, two, three, four missiles on the book that shut down MH17 five hours before the shootdown. If we look at a video filmed the next morning around five or six in the morning in Luhansk. This missile was missing. There's only three missiles. And we know what happened to that missile. And there are many ways to know exactly when and where this video was taken. One reason, or one way we know, is at the end of this video, we see fuel prices. And if we look at historical data of what the fuel prices were on the day of the MH17 shootdown and compare, they were the exact same prices that we see right here. So I know exactly when the video was taken. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So when <coughs> when we were shoot, when I saw that scene, I just thought, yes, we have to make this into a drama series because it is so new and so relevant. It's saying something about our world today, where younger generation, like, like it's hard to know who to trust, right? In a, in a world where media mm -hmm. all becomes propaganda, it's very hard to know what is truth or not. So yeah, so that's when I thought let's make a drama series about this and um, yeah, and I start and I had been thinking about writers for this project and really loved the writing of Leonardo Fazzoli. 
He was Who working. did it, Camorra? Yes, yeah. and he was working on 000 at the time. And I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and he was working part of the time from there. Yeah. So we started talking about it, and he very much loved it. Yeah. He also has like, um, like children, and he's also very much thinking about like teenager kids, like how to, yeah, like because it's also kind of a hopeful story without being kind of educational good, right? Mm -hmm. It's about in a world where a lot of things are overwhelming and big, and seems like there's no solution for anything. People are standing together trying to fight. Yes, yeah. exactly. And so he was very like tar like really liked that idea, and also it's about young people who are finding their way in the world for him and so that's what that's kind of what he a like how he came to the script and what he thought the series should be about like mm -hmm. it's about people having their first serious love relationship and finding having their first jobs that they really care for and mm -hmm. want to fight for and and um, so we're currently working on this series and it was recently announced by the uh, european alliance so which is uh, zdf rye Yes. Uh, and France Television. Yes. Yeah. And so we're currently writing the season and hopefully start production early spring. Yeah. Um, uh, and when you talk about it's a limited series. First. No, it's a returnable series because it's very much like season one. Oh, yeah, you one. can make use of it actually. Yeah, the characters. Yeah, like normal. yeah, because the characters go the group continues and they yeah. grow and each season will have like <coughs> an overall investigation okay. and yeah. yeah, yeah. But this is really like I think an example of like things in the real world inspir inspiring us to create drama series basically yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're very obsessed or you really are into that because we we, we spoke once about the uh, boosting impact which is something ah, yeah, we exactly. are very much and that is very much uh built upon uh stories mm -hmm. already researched by journalists or yes. I mean, uh, the panama papers also these there are these yeah. conglomerates of uh, journalists going together to uh, to create the uh, to f not but to unreveal Yes, the the most important stories. No, uh, I really, I very much love that. Like also series, I love what like series like the uh, Dope Sick, for example, about yeah. the Sackler family or uh, Drop Out about the Turner scandal. I like have the those same. Yeah. yeah. So you I are actually into. So th those are ingredients you are <coughs> looking for actually, or that that you are intrigued with. When definitely, that's definitely yeah. sort of kind of one area because yeah. I think the world is fascinating the world around is fascinating yeah. and i come from a documentary background for me filmmaking is very much an excuse yeah. to dive into a world that i i'm just curious about we just started working on a series about esports the yeah. world of esports and it's just for me a fascinating subculture yeah. and it's bigger than the nba and in terms of economic size but it's kind of s this hidden world that most of the people here won't play them won't even know the the names who the like stars. who the f stars are <laughs> nope. right and and then it's i love like diving into like something new and finding yeah. all about it fascinating <laughs> tony you have chosen a clip from in this world mm. which is a film by michael winterbottom that you wrote and you you traveled with him. I, I let us just set the scene before we. So yeah. it's interesting because we didn't yeah. arrange this. No, nope. but there are there are I interesting, didn't. there are interesting connections. I think. Yeah, it's it's um it's from a film. It's a, a clip from a film uh, called In This World, which uh, Michael Winterbottom directed, um, and uh, it's a fiction, but it's very very strongly based on fact. Um, uh, partly on around 150 or something accounts of, of people being smuggled from um, uh, Afghanistan and uh, Pakistan to the UK. And this was, we filmed it in 2002, um, but we were writing it and researching it from uh, 2000, late 2000, 2001. Um, and uh, it l it looked has a documentary filter in a way, but it it is a fiction. Um, and this particular scene, just to set it up, is that we have two guys in Ayatollah and um, Jamal, who is much younger, and they are Afghani's. Uh, they come from a, a refugee camp in uh, Peshawar in Pakistan, and um, the <coughs> they are uh, th they've paid a people smuggler to get them uh, overland to the UK, they hope. 
and um, we now meet them on a bus in Iran and um, I think that's enough and then that yeah. speaks for itself and, and here's that section. So we'd like to see clip number three. <laughs> So, it's a very powerful film. It was uh, it was a big thing at that time. It still is when I saw, when I saw it again. Uh, what is it that kind of because it's, it's it's it feels like a documentary, but of course you can feel that it's very also with the music and so on. It's very the music by Dario Marianelli, uh, yeah, it was just amazing. But it, that's part of the this weird mix between. Yeah. Um, uh, non-actors, non-professional actors being cast, um, but but being but people cast who were close to the characters they were playing. Yeah. 
um, and uh, being shot on on the, they were uh, like PD 150s, oh, yeah. you know, uh, at the time, which was a really yeah. nice camera, in fact, and and shot on those and also on uh, camcorders. Um, so no tripod. Um, Marcel Ziskind, um, uh, 22 years old or something, <laughs> shooting, <laughs> amazing, you know. Um, and um, it's, a, it's, an in, it's an interesting mix and very, very structured story, in fact, um, because you can't, one, practically you couldn't travel across all those countries without knowing what you were going to do or yeah. going to try and do. So um, it, it, it's really, I think it's really pretty much the, the best filmmaking experience I've ever had for lots of different reasons. I mean, one was um, that up until just before that, I got involved in that. Um, I've been working with uh, Terry Gilliam, and that had his own joys. But um, we, uh, I think, he, one iteration of Quixote had collapsed, and um, something else also collapsed. So nothing was happening, and it's. And I've been lucky because at these dips, someone's turned up, you know, and I thought, oh, some new opportunity, and I, I arranged to meet Michael and we talked about what we both wanted to do and he said I really want to make a, a film about refugees journeys Did, that was that was all there was and then um, I said well I want to do it and uh, and uh, I started with reading about accounts of being smuggled and there were there were lots of those accounts around and then I met lots of people and gradually pieced together um, g gave these two uh, young guys, the stories that I came across, and so it was, it was really a way of not writing, and that that and that was really exciting. Not writing. Yeah, it was really exciting, and I and I and it you know it's um it wasn't sitting like a, a vulture in front of the fucking laptop. You know, it was um it was something else. It was not it was not homework. So it had a life to it, and it was being and it was it, as opposed to working with. With Terry, it was always about making a world, and this was the opposite. This was this was being informed by the world and by other people's stories, you know. And that's and that's the beginning of what makes it so exciting. And then, because I, you know, I can't, I'm not going to write. You can't write dialogue for non-professional actors. No. So it, you know, you you can write what happens, um, <coughs> and you can do all of that. Um, but then just me and Michael went out, and I think it was three weeks after 9-11, and we, we just tested the route uh, overland, oh. the two of us traveling, yeah. and um, like a couple of students or something, but in reverse. <coughs> you know. And uh, we out, went out there. And I, I, m I remember thinking that I was less afraid of the Taliban uh, catching us than of, of having to spend, you know, uh, time in a prison with Michael Winterbottom, <laughs> become a <like> Midnight <laughs> Express or something. <laughs> awful, you know. But um, did you write while you were travelling? Uh, well, r write notes, yeah. uh, and uh, and things happened to us. You know, we were stopped in the desert by someone like that guy. Yeah. And um, uh, and you know, lots of things. And and I just put it back into the the thing. And and also, Michael is kind of perverse in many many ways. And and so he'd, you know, I remember looking at a particular border, and and I was I was saying, okay, so this is the route down here, and he was looking at the top of the map, and saying, oh, there's a road here, and I said, yeah, no, this is the route down here, Michael. I think, yeah. and he said, yeah, there's a road, rose up. Here. I said, well, there's a, Michael, there's a war up there. You know? <laughs> yeah. He said, yeah. yeah, but there's a there's a road through. I said, Michael, there's a there's a war, you know, <laughs> and he said, yeah, but in, you know, he, and well, he, why do we go there? He yeah. want, of course, he wants to go there, and so so we did go there. And then there were these people, the soldiers there, and they said, "You can't go here because there's a war." <laughs> and I, I, I said, "You know, Michael." And he said, "Oh yeah." And I said, "Okay, so we go." Back. And I remember <laughs> holding up a piece of paper. This, mind, we've been travelling a long time by the sun. And I held up a piece of <coughs> white paper and I put it in his face. I said, "What colour is it?" And he said, "What are you doing? What are you doing?" I said, "What colour? What colour is it, Michael? <laughs> you can't tell me what colour this piece of paper is." Um, but that perversity also feeds in because he, he he goes against. But isn't that them. also something that the directors can sometimes bring? Is that they go further? I mean, if they're really obsessed with something, they have. I mean, I remember. No, I have just irritating. It's, <laughs> not, it's, it's, it's just irritating, and then you make the best of it. No, he, he does. He does find. The, but the great thing about Michael, and we were talking about this in the car, is that is that he didn't fall for the auteur thing. 
So he kind of reinvents himself on every project. He tries a bit of that, he does a bit of that, he does something with stars in it, he does something like that. And so he kept on moving. So for a time, Michael had made a huge number of films, but no one knew his name yeah. because they didn't know how to sell them. But anyway, the, the, just to cut to the chase again, is the point of one of the points of that film was that after that, I fell in love, one, with not writing, and two, I fell in love with trying to work, trying to use a similar sort of method on projects. And it, it what did it with Southcliffe, did it with various other things where instead of trying to write, oh, um, you know, uh, someone who is bereaved, right, and in grief, instead of trying to write that, I'd go and find people and say, can I talk to you about that? Can you tell me your experience of having lost someone very close to you? Do you, do you mind talking about that? And people will tell you lots and lots of stories. And then, you know, I for once shut up and listen and uh, take those stories. And they, they guide, because they always, they always have detail and... Uh, and accounts and ways of thinking, mm -hmm. which y I wouldn't have invented, you know, which is, and so I, I, I just really enjoy that. I mean, I have started writing again, thank God, but but <laughs> but I enjoyed, really loved that period of not doing that. Of Was it something also about, because I think we talked about once that you also like wanted to to uh, create productions that were kind of light, where you didn't have to travel with all the, the, the crews and all of this well shebang. That, that but, but there was eight of us on this. Yes, I know, that's, why I say, that's why I asked. No, but it was wonderful. Yeah, that's yeah. what I you asked. Know, and you can run around. Yeah. You know? The you feeling of being lighter. Yeah, and you can and do things quickly. Mm -hmm. And I mean, nothing is quick in this yeah. game, is it? Everything takes like yeah. months and months and years. And Jesus Christ. You know, and, and so the idea of, of just doing something quickly is, was really exciting, of yeah. course. And also, and, and you know, as uh, you know, Michael uh, always said, you know, it's a great thing um, with the projects is the further away from the office you can shoot, the yeah. better, because you know they can't catch you so easily. <laughs> and and with this, you know, they say, oh, can we see the rushes? Well, you know, it's going to take a couple of weeks, <laughs> you know, but can't you find it? Well, not really. And then we'd have to move on because yeah. we can't stay in one place, and you know, so, so th no one could keep track of us we just went mm. that's great curiosity <laughs> just to ask because mm. I, I isn't that also something that's in you both of you being i mean you you're going on this journey with michael winterbottom yeah. and you are going into the bellingcat story and i i think what you've been doing all of you also like you say with mm. michael winterbottom he's he he makes so different stuff all the time he's, he's mm. always chasing new ways of i mean yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, it's nice to, I think, it, you know, people say, oh, wh what kind of, you know, were you asked at the beginning, what kind of, what kind of thing do you want? Yes. You know? And I guess one of the things, I, I want something that's as unlike that one, yeah. Yeah. that last one as possible. Yeah. If that was, if that was white, I want to do this black, you know. Yeah. Uh, isn't that? Totally. Mm. I mean, I think curiosity is super, like, yeah, like what I said earlier, that you have the desire to find out about something. Yeah. This would yeah. be, yeah, absolutely yeah. important. I think we ha we have a, a guy tomorrow coming talking to us, and he's like, he said something like this, mm. that if uh, if you're not busy learning, you're busy dying, or if you're not busy <laughs> being curious, you're busy dying. I mean, so it's it's about <laughs> it's about keep going. We asked you uh, to do a little exercise. Oh, I forgot about this. Yeah, exercise. but you have to. Yeah, uh, we asked you to come up with a story. That then how would Femke be approaching it as a yeah, producer? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, this is a terrible thing. You know very well, one, I wanted to undermine your <laughs> ridiculous suggestion. And two, I just, I just thought, what, I, what am I going to talk about? Because the ones that I've got, which are, I am developing, yeah. Yeah. We, you know, there's already, you know, it's like me and uh, Laura Piani up there, we're working on something together, but we kind of know where we're going with it. So I don't yeah. think... It would, it's very interesting in a way. Yeah. I mean, uh, so I I just thought uh, it's, this, it, it's, this is a little bit more difficult because it's so new. But it is at least I thought I must do something that I'm genuinely interested in. Okay, so it, but it's in pieces, so I can only apologise yeah. and throw myself upon your mercy, <laughs> and you can help me make this something of, out of this. So the, the the thing is this is that s some years ago I was investigating Philip K. Dick. The, the writer and I got very deep into this investigation I went to all the places where he lived I met all the f 
crazy friends, the family, everyone did all this. And there's a thing about when you do that kind of research, you really, you, you get very, very deep into it and, and you know, your sanity suffers slightly. So there's a, there's a kind of obsession with that. Now that story in the end couldn't happen yeah. because of estate and all kinds yeah. of other problems. Um, and you, and that idea was to make it about his life. I, I was going to combine parts of his life with a story that he never wrote but told. Oh, yeah. I put it together and we were going with it, but it, it wasn't, uh, we had the backing of the estate in fact, but other, other, there were other problems, anyway. yeah. it, it meant it couldn't happen. And actually one of them is to do with the reality of it. Anyway, so that was that, and I was just thinking uh, there's something about that investigation into a life which interests me a lot. And then quite recently a, a very good friend of mine died and um, I'm finding myself now more and more interested in investigating his life. Now he was a larger than life man and he was also a throwback, you know. He wasn't like a nice contemporary m man, you know. He was, he was horrible. What's and a throw <laughs> throwback? Is an awful person or a backwards person? He, he was, uh, he was like, he, he, you'd think he was from 1950 right. or something. His morals, his yeah. codes, everything. He behaved very badly, which made him, re which I really loved him for. Yeah. You know, because <laughs> he was just so, he was such a villain in so many ways. And he had five, wives or partners you know. yeah and um and at the same time no 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 he was a, a, a serial monogamist you know right, so you right. but they overlapped a bit i think and <laughs> and 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 it was just there there are these th he was also very funny and the, the humor continued into the, the funeral so that you know the, most of the wives sat on one pew and, and one wouldn't you know and there's all sorts of things happening like this. And when the curtains go around the coffin before it goes into the, the, the crematorium, you know, everyone's saying, it's going to stick, it's going to stick. And then you put <laughs> the, I hope it sticks, I hope it sticks. <laughs> so so many things went like this. But I've become a bit obsessed with, I suppose, trying to, uh, trying to investigate the big gap that he's left. And maybe it's to do with the effect on different people. Yes. But it's also to do and it's this is not just him but I, I've become more and more aware how he was very different people very different person with different people mm. and and I suspect that's the same with all of us uh -huh. but with him it was it because he was such an extreme character it was it was a much bigger um, it was a much bigger uh, effect you know yeah you know what I'm saying? And, and and I'm afraid that's about it because I can go into I can tell you lots of stories like we went to investigate a ghost once on the Isle of Man, and I just it was a flight was at eight a.m. and he and uh, we went to the airport and he he said right you know let's get some drinks and I decided you know what I'm not going to start drinking at eight a.m. with you and and so he didn't stop him he's, he's you know, <laughs> he had the beer and I so I went and bought a copy of of the Guardian newspaper to to read that and then we were on the plane. And um, I was reading the Guardian newspaper, being sensible, and I noticed that there was a flame and smoke coming up. <laughs> and he had set it on fire. <laughs> on the fire. And this was at a time when you didn't then get put in prison for being a terrorist. The, the, the air hostess said, oh, uh, oh, your paper's on fire, sir, and put it out, you know. Th but there's like dozens of these. Yes. These and it's, just, it's like <laughs> if there was a way of him <laughs> being bad, he would be. And he just did terrible, terrible he's things. He's a all the time. fantastic character. I love him, you know. Yeah. And okay, so but now he's gone. So there's this gap, yeah. and I'm just trying to find a way of. I don't. I, that's, I'm, that's the problem is now yours. <laughs> no, I, know, I know that I meant to solve the problem, and you're the producer. But there's something in there. There's, I just keep on thinking there's something, but it feels like an investigation. Or, it, I mean. I, don't, I mean, I, I just don't know what to do with it. It's like, okay, so here's a story about a, a writer, you know, researching someone and becoming, maybe that's it, getting involved and researching into what happened to this person. But means you have to have a connection with the people that were left behind. Maybe that's it. And it leads you some way you never go. Maybe that's the story. Yeah, or there's, it could be about, could it be about the friendship between you and like one element you... And that would be maybe real or fictional. 
like one a mystery in him or it's something mm. you want to find out and that brings you to the other people and discovering all his other um, personalities or sides of his personality. And I wonder and if it could go like dark. A, right. And uh, because I I think it probably could go dark. I think that's the trouble. I think I think you know if you are going to th there's um the painter uh uh Sickert. Yes. He 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 used to have separate um studios dotted around London and people connected with that studio that you know the, the prostitute who would be the model or the people in the bar on the corner they wouldn't know about the existence of these others yes and meanwhile home wouldn't know about them yeah but he it was very important for him to compartmentalize keep them all separate it's a bit like you know when people have several marriages yes and they, they they visit the marriage no one knows that they yeah. exist um yeah, I love that because then it's a mystery, right? Yeah. And they're almost yeah. a detective. Yeah, 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 yeah. The detective thing is good, and the yeah. Yeah, but I also think you should write at Philip K. Dick. Yeah, I you think know, that's a brilliant idea. Can't you combine? Idea. Yeah, I get, can I tell you a story? Yes. It, so there's when on this journey yeah. right, to investigate Philip K. Dick, I, towards the end, it was very extreme, you know. And towards the end, I was staying um, with um, uh, I think it was wife three, and. Um, <laughs> uh, and she said, oh, sure, you can stay here, you know. And, and she had this sort of house w and where she used to share with Phil. And, uh, uh, and she had converted one of the rooms into a little self-contained suite. Yes. You know. And she could stay in this suite. It's got a bathroom and it's got, you know, all this. Thing. And, she'd, and Phil used to write in this room. And I said, oh, really? Oh, fantastic. Now I'm staying in the room where Philip K. Dick wrote, you know. And I, say, and I looked out the window. I thought oh, he would have looked at this same landscape. And I thought... That's probably where the, you know, that great God in the, s he saw the great God of metal in the sky that yeah. depressed him. And all these things happen here. And oh, this is fantastic. Anyway, so in the morning I got up, I went to take a shower. And I went to look at the shower. And on the shower head, there was a little green frog. <laughs> and it, it was just sitting like this on the shower head. And I looked at, I saw it. It, it, it was alive. Yeah. Wow. And it was, but it wouldn't move. It was just, that's the frog. And and I went and I thought, oh, okay, the frog. I didn't want it to jump on me, so I had a very quick shower, <laughs> and right, and then got out of the shower, and, I, and that was it. Then went around the day doing the various things, and then you know went back home. Then in the morning got up, went into the shower, and there's the fucking frog, <laughs> and, it, and it's it's just sitting on this same place, not moving. And I was like, okay, okay, is the frog. And I went in there, I said, like, quick, very quick shower, and get out. <laughs> right, third day, third day. You know, <clears throat> I get up in the morning, I go, and there's a frog, it's, it's there. And I'm looking at the frog, it's ridiculous, this frog. And I'm looking at the frog, and I'm thinking, it's weird that it's somehow the frog, the frog's face looks like Philip K. Dick's <laughs> face. And as I had the thought, it went, and it, this frog looked at me, right? And I thought, okay, I have to go home now. <laughs> <laughs> so you never dare do that story, no? Well... Thank you very much. It has been great. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> with these words. That's a great story. You can always do Q&A, uh, and uh, we do them all the time. But uh, you are here for the next 10 minutes or so on. So uh, if anyone wants to come to, to ask you something. We'll tell you the things that we didn't want you want recorded. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Um, and thank you for taking your time, Tony and uh, Femke. Bye-bye.